Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the eighth of our webinars for 2018. I'm Tom Pritchard, and my co-host for today, who I'll be passing you over to very shortly, is Matthew Gilbert. Today, we're going to be discussing the assessment of concrete bridge decks using limit state slab. We'll introduce you to the technology behind our automated yield line analysis software, and this will be with a particular focus on bridge deck analysis. The first section, which relates to the theory and the mechanics behind the software, will be developed by Matthew, and then I'll take over with some examples that demonstrate how the software can be used for a variety of different bridge analysis situations. The main part of the webinar will run for about 40 minutes and will also include a few minutes at the end for questions. You can post these at any time during the webinar via the interface that should be present in front of you. And while we do try to get around to as many of the questions as we can, sometimes it isn't always possible, so we do apologise in advance if we can't get around to yours. Um, that said, we do always follow up on any unanswered questions after the webinar is finished and you can always get in touch with us at any time via email at info at limitstate.com. So I'll now pass you over to Matthew who's going to talk to you about yieldline theory and its implementation in Limit States Lab. Thanks very much, Tom, and thanks for uh, joining us today. Right then. So, first slide I'm going to show is a series of examples. Um, this pictures on the left-hand side are, are, are pictures of yield line patterns of the sort you might see in textbooks. So we've got a, a point-loaded slab and a, a slab subject to a, a line load. On the right, um, we see, in contrast, completely uh, different types of mechanisms of the sort we might find when we analyze the more complex problems. Actually, the two um, examples on the right actually relate to um, bridge problems. And what you can see is that the yield line mechanisms that you can see there would be potentially quite difficult to um, identify via hand. Um, the same mechanisms are shown here, but in different forms, so we can just see um, animation of the, the mode of response just to make things clearer. And again, you can see that the, um, the mechanisms on the right-hand side are of a much more complex nature. So what we're going to be looking at today is how we can identify uh, these more complex mechanisms using uh, hopefully easy-to-use software. Right, so before I get into the, uh, the sort of the bread and butter of the, uh, of the webinar, I'll just uh, say a few words about the company, Limit State, uh, the producers of the software, then a, a bit of introduction to the yield line method, which is used by the Limit State Slab software, which we'll be, be using today, uh, provide a software demonstration, um, and then a talk about how it works. Um, then I'll hand over to my colleague, uh, Tom Pritchard, who will... Uh, apply the software to uh, more practical uh, bridge problems and then we'll wrap up with conclusions and questions. Okay, so first thing about Limit State, uh, who are we? Uh, what are we in business to do? Really our mission is to provide engineers with powerful software, um, easy to use and taking advantage of um, optimization technology which uh, is not found in, in, in currently available uh, um, tools in the marketplace. Um, big focus um, historically for the company has been uh, ultimate limit state analysis and design. So looking at tools which very rapidly analyze the ultimate limit state. And on the right hand side you can see uh, just a handful of the, uh, the companies that use our software, uh, which is actually used in, in more than 30 countries worldwide. Uh, in terms of, of where we fit compared with traditional um, software tools, um, we basically sit in, in, in the middle. Um, the one extreme, the left-hand side of this image, you can see uh, traditional automated hand calculation methods. Um, advantage of those is they're, they're, they're normally pretty easy to use and you can get solutions pretty quickly. Downside is that... Uh, you often have compromises on the uh, on the quality of the solution. So typically, um, 
uh, the solution that you get will not necessarily be the precise solution for sorry, the solution for the precise geometry that you're dealing with. It will be some uh, um, approximation of that. At the other extreme, we have advanced tools, so for example, based on nonlinear finite elements and so forth. Um, those tools are very flexible and powerful. The downside is they tend to need quite a lot of uh, time to set up the, the problem, quite a lot of operator ex ex expertise, and also quite a lot of time to get solutions. So sitting in the middle, um, our rigid plastic analysis tools um, uh, basically offer you the best of both. They're quick and easy to use. You deal with arbitrary geometries um, and uh, yeah, take a uh, uh, relatively low amount of time. Um, the software I'm going to be talking about today is Limit State Slab, which automates the yield line method. So it's worth just uh, just saying a few words about what the yield line method is, um, for those of you not familiar. Um, basically, the, the term yield line appears to have been first coined by um, Danish engineer Ingerslev in the 1920s. And then one of his, his countrymen, Johansson, um, developed a much more... Um, um, comprehensive theory to, to underpin what we now uh, refer to as the yield line method. And we now know also this is an upper bound uh, plastic analysis method. So in terms of um, actually doing a, a yield line analysis, typically what we would do by hand is, is select a mechanism. Um, typically we'd use work method, quite internal external work and use that to identify the load factor um, at collapse. We then may um, try different mechanism geometries and also potentially different mechanisms um, in order to be, be sure that we have a, a reasonably um, accurate representation of the, um, the murder response of this slab at collapse. Um, Benefits, it's, it's simple, it's direct. You get straight there to um, the collapse load or load factor. Um, the big economic benefit is that um, if you are um, assessing uh, a slab, then you get a more realistic assessment of the true clap, collapse load capacity of a slab typically. Or if you're doing uh, a design, you can end up with a more economical design than you otherwise would, um, certainly compared with using an elastic method. The downside is that if you choose the wrong mechanism, then you overestimate the true collapse load. Um, other cons is that it only considers flexural failure, so it doesn't consider shear failure, for example. And also it doesn't include uh, any consideration of the situation prior to collapse. It doesn't give you serviceability deflection uh, predictions, for example. Um, in terms of um, the sort of... Um, popularity of the, of the method, um, it, it um, had a, sort of a bit of resurgence certainly in the bridge engineering community in the 1990s and 2000s when Middleton and co-workers at Cambridge basically used the method to show that many concrete um, bridges had hidden reserves of strength. If you think about it, if you design a bridge using elastic methods for a particular load carrying capacity, you then require that bridge to take heavier vehicles, and almost by definition, um, that bridge is not going to be um, um, strong enough to carry those increased axle loads. However, if you switch the method, so move from elastic to plastic, then uh, Middleton showed that actually many of the bridges that he looked at did actually um, have the sufficient capacity. The way he did that was basically loop through a series of potential failure mechanisms um, for every given uh, loading configuration. So you can see uh, on the right hand side of this slide a library of um, actually 27 mechanisms. Um, so proved a, a, a very um, um, useful way of, of, of demonstrating um, that, that many bridges had more strength than expected. The downside of this, however, is that uh, there is always the worry that there's a failure mechanism that's, that's going to uh, be relevant to the bridge that you're looking at that hasn't actually uh, been entered into this library. So perhaps mechanism 28 is critical in your bridge, but, but clearly this, this particular type of approach uh, won't pick that up. 
Um, so the outcomes then was that uh, bridge owners had uh, um, substantial savings um, because they didn't need to strengthen many, many, many bridges, uh, or as many bridges as they expected. So this this next slide just uh, just picks up again the issue that I did mention. Um, sometimes the critical yield line pattern is more complex, not obvious. There's always a concern that uh, the yield line pattern that's applicable to your particular structure um, isn't actually uh, picked up at, picked up on in the tool, or if you're doing it by hand, has been missed. You could use non-linear elements to to do the analysis, but uh, that's expensive in terms of time and operator expertise. So what I'm going to do is, um, is just uh, start up the software and um, just give you a, a quick flavor of, um, of how you can use the software um, for, for example, um, simple bridge slab geometries. And then I'll explain um, how it actually works. So if I um, just uh, start up a, an empty slab project, so I'm not going to enter all the details. Um, I'll have a, um, a geometry of, I don't know, um, eight by three meters. And I'll click finish. So then I end up with a um, effectively a, a template um, that I can use to help me actually draw this geometry. So I'm actually going to just draw a couple of rectangles. So let's suppose this is, this is my bridge slab. Let's suppose it's got some, um, some edge beams. So I'm going to actually um, draw those in as well. It looks like I've given me that edge beam slightly thicker than the other one due to my, uh, I'll just make it the same. Uh, so you can see this has got a simple CAD functionality to enable me to edit the um, the geometry. So that's my geometry. Um, I'm going to put some boundary conditions on there. So um, I'm going to select the the ends, and I'm going to just say that these are simply supported. So I've now got the geometry and some boundaries. Um, for simplicity, I'm going to um, use one of the built-in um, slab structural definitions. In reality, you would um, define your own. I'm going to use uh, the unit MP structural definition for the, for the slab in the middle, and I'm actually going to duplicate that and actually um, um, have slightly different properties for that um, for the edge beams. And just to s indicate that it's different, I'm going to change the, um, the material. Uh, sorry, the colour. So, put that there, and also I can edit the the, the, pro the properties. So let's just say that I've got um, a much um, stronger, uh, much high MP value for the for the edge beams and the slab. So I'll just set this an arbitrary value. So I've now got um, some slab properties. Um, there. What I haven't got at the moment is any loads. So what I'm going to do is just uh, uh, um, I shall add a initially a, um, a pressure load, just a unit pressure load, and that should be enough for me to actually um, do a, a simple analysis. And you can see it's a very very dull um, collapse mechanism, um, um, as you might expect um, for this particular problem. Now. What I'm going to do is, is make things a little bit more interesting by changing the, um, the, the loading. So I'm going to go into Load Kiss Manager. I'm actually going to delete that pressure load, and I'm going to replace it with a, um, a point load. So it's a simple unit point. I'll put that, um, um, let's just say, at a particular location. So I've now got a point load. Um, particular location and if I click solve now we end up with a very much more um, complex failure mechanism so typically when we're uh, analyzing bridges um, we have a variety of different loading configurations to deal with 
Tom will talk more, more detail about um, how we can do that. So for now, I'm just um, I'm just illustrating uh, the, the kind of things that we can do. So I can also put on an, another symmetrical point load, see how that changes the, the mode of response. Um, and perhaps um, just uh, um, add a, another couple before I, I move on. Um, what you will see in the console window at the bottom is something I haven't talk, talked about is actually um, an adequacy factor. In general, the adequacy factor um, when you put in realistic properties is the margin of safety. However, because I've got unit values for the plastic moment of resistance and also for the loads, it really is it's, it's more a, um, a load multiplier of the sort that you see in academic papers. So you can see that you can have um, a whole variety of different arbitrary failure mechanisms identified very, very quickly using uh, this software. And so that brings me to um, the question, how do we actually um, get those solutions? How, do, how does this automated yield line method work? Well, it uses something called discontinuity layout optimization, or DLO for short. Um, the original uh, publication describing application of DLO for slabs was, was published in 2014, and we also described it in a more uh, engineer-friendly paper in 2015 in the Structural Engineer. Um, the main thing is that, in mathematical terms, is a very simple linear um, problem, so that's easy to solve. In terms of how, how, how it actually works, if you imagine you've got a slab, so we've got a square slab with fixed supports. We discretize that slab geometry with nodes. We then connect each node to every other node with a potential yield line. And then we use optimization to find the, the minimum energy um, or critical yield line pattern um, with that nodal discretization. So you can see that uh, yield line pattern shown in the right-hand side. In terms of the, um, the mathematics, um, basically we're, we're minimizing energy. So it's simple energy calculation, similar to what you, you, you would do by hand. Um, for convenience, uh, we apply unit displacement, and then we enforce compatibility, but enforce compatibility at nodes. And basically, that boils down to going around each and every other node, each, each, every, each and every node in the problem, and making sure that the yield line rotations sum to zero in the x and y directions. So it's actually very akin to resolving forces in a, in a truss. And in fact, in the structural engineer paper, we actually use uh, um, this, this is an example to show that uh, um, similarity. Okay, so I'm going to um, stop there and uh, hand back over to um, Tom, who's going to uh, talk you through applying the software to um, bridges. Thanks, Matthew. And as Matthew mentioned, I'm going to go through now just a number of quick examples to show you how you can apply limit state slab to a number of different bridge examples. So the first one is going to be a simple slab with a single axle loading, and then we'll just move on to an irregular shaped slab with a vehicle loading, and then finally onto a beam and slab bridge deck example. So for the first one, which is a simple slab with an axle load, it's basically just to give a bit more of an overview of how the software works. So picking up on the things that Matthew had done previously. So if I open the software, we can go back to the beginning. Um, what we're going to model is a bridge deck with a notional um, 15 ton single axle load on top of it. And we shall assume for now that this load is in the middle of the slab. What we may want to do later is look at critical cases by moving that load about. And that's what I'm going to touch on in the second and third examples. So um, what we want to do is find out what the factor on the load is. And for the sake of this example, we're going to have minimal top reinforcement 
that is in a rectangular arrangement with no skew to it, although you can actually introduce that into the software should you wish. So we'll get onto it. So in the wizard, what we'll do, we'll start a new one. I won't save Matthew's file. We'll just create a new empty file. And again, don't worry about this. This is just project data. Um, what I want to do here is instead of setting the extents manually, I'm going to auto calculate the extents so that will actually change the size of the grid as we need to. And then I will click finish. So we can see here that we've got a six by six grid and then um, we can start working with that. So all we want to do is start with a rectangle. So I'm going to go from zero, zero, and then right click and add a point and my end point for the rectangle is going to be at 7.85. So here's our rectangle. You can see that the grid expanded to accommodate that. And what we can do is now we have our simple slab geometry. I'm just going to select the top and the bottom boundaries. And in the property editor on the right hand side here, just change the support type to be simple. So it's a very, very basic um, simply supported on two sides slab. And now we have the geometry and the boundary conditions. What we want to do is set some mechanical properties. So as Matthew showed earlier, we create a new structural definition. And for this, we're going to call it slab. And I'll make the color slightly darker just so that we know that we're using this one. And we can see here we've got the first and second direction for our reinforcement. So the MP is worth noting that the angles measured um, between the global x axis anti clockwise and it's the direction in which it's acting, not necessarily the actual angle of the reinforcement bars. So it's normal to them rather than um, the angle themselves. So if we've got an angle here of zero, then that's going to be vertical bars rather than horizontal bars. So that's worth bearing in mind as we go through the example. But for this one, what we've got in the vertical direction, we've got quite a high um, sagging capacity, so 120, but less top reinforcement. So we're going to have 10 for hogging. And then in the second direction, um, this is less important. So we've got less reinforcement here. We'll have a sag of 15 and a hog of two. What we can also do is if we are wanting to consider the self weight of the slab in the problem, then we can apply properties to it. So I can add 0.35 for the thickness and 24 kilonewtons per meter cubed for the unit weight. And if we want to, when we set the problem going, we can say, OK, consider the self weight of this slab as um, part of the driver towards collapse. Um, I'll set these here, but we won't actually consider it within the problem. So if I click OK, we can see now we've got this slab definition, which I can apply to the problem. And the next thing we want to do is actually add some loading to it. So a bit like Matthew did previously, we'll go into the loading dialog. And you can see here we've got different types of loads that we can apply. So we've got the self-weight load, which we don't actually want to do here. Also, you can apply pressure, line or point loads. And for an axle, what we're going to do is we're going to apply two point loads next to each other. So if I go to the bottom here and go to add new, then 15 tons works out to be about 75 kilonewtons. So I'm going to say 15, uh, 75 kilonewton wheel load there, give it a value of 75 and the load type um, can be variable. If I click OK there, then now what we can do is start to add this 75 kN wheel load to the points on the, the slab that we want them to be applied to. So if I click OK, then I can click on here, go to 75 kN wheel load, and if I click Change, turn on the grid, we can see that I can select these points here. Um, so my first one is going to be at 3, 2.5. So if I go to 3, 2.5 is there. And my second one is going to be at position um, 4.8, 2.5. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 4.8, 2.5 is about there. We can see now that we've got both wheel loads applied for that axle. So if I click OK, you can see here that those two point loads for our axle are now applied. The last thing we may want to do, but we're not going to do in this case, is 
if you want to change the partial safety factors you can do that there in the load case manager so we would just select new and define our own um, partial safety factors for this particular problem but for this one we're going to keep it at unity click OK so now we've got all the things that we need in order to solve our problem we've got a geometry we've got supports we've got some loading and we've got a slab with some material properties so if I click on solve what we can actually see is that we get a warning to say that uh, there's a mismatch between the self weight loading status and the properties so basically it's saying I have applied some self weight properties to my slab structural definition but I haven't actually set the self weight to be considered within the analysis and in this particular case that's okay I don't mind about that but this diagnostics message uh, this sort of feature is actually quite useful for picking up things such as that that you may have forgotten about or you may not um, appreciate about the analysis that you're about to undertake so this is always worth having a look at before you solve so in this case we have no errors uh, just one warning that which we're quite happy with so I'll click OK to solve and you'll see it very quickly goes through and actually works out the critical failure mechanism and what the adequacy factor on the applied load so those two wheel loads is so in this case it's 3.23 um, 3.29 sorry so that corresponds to um, the multiplier on the wheel load that we can take into consideration before collapse will occur and what you can see is the failure mechanism is actually quite akin to the interior horizontal six-way fan that Matthew was showed as part of the 27 different um, collapse mechanisms that um, Cobras was taking into consideration um, so that's would have been picked up there but it's also been picked up here very quickly um, the last thing I'm going to show just for this simple example is that once you've solved and come up with a critical failure mechanism what you can do is actually generate a report that will then tell you all the pertinent things about that particular problem including the failure mechanism what that adequacy factor is and what all of the um, data that you've applied within that analysis is so that then you can use that at a later date so that was the first example that we were looking at which was a very simple one the next thing we're going to do is actually go on to an irregular flat slab and this is based on a problem um, from real life so what we've got is a part which is actually in the middle of a highway and it was on a verge but then it's going to be covered over and used in the middle of a highway um, and you need to check the, the capacity of that was sufficient to take the loading of large vehicles so um, changing from being a verge where there was very little loading to being the center of a highway where there's potentially a lot of loading from for instance lorries changing lanes and things like that wanted to make sure that you could um, rely on that part of the slab to be sufficient to take that extra weight without any extra reinforcement being required so we have the geometry of the problem we have the load vehicle that we wish to apply to it and we also know what the uh, material properties of the slab in that particular position are so we've got um, sagging of 90 kN meters per meter and hogging of zero so no top reinforcement and we know what the um, wheel loading is and also an additional pressure loading from adding some more tarmac over the top of that particular part of the structure so if we go back into slab the first thing we can do is open up the file looking at the boundaries we can see that we have simple supports along the top the left and the bottom and we also have a slab in the middle here which has a structural definition if I click on that we can see that we've got um, positive MP of 90 in both the first and second directions and we have a thickness of 0.31 a unit weight of 24 so we've defined this slab material and we've applied it to that trapezoidal um, part of the slab the next thing to do is to look at the loading so if I open the loading dialog what we can actually see here is that we've already 
um, got this set up because it's a file that I'd saved earlier. But what we've got is a pressure load, which is a superimposed, which I just generated by clicking this add new option here. And then if I look in the loads database, we can see that that superimposed load is 2.26 kilonewtons per meter squared or 2.26 kilopascals. Similarly, we have um, defined our 82 kilonewton wheel load here in the point loads options. And if we scroll down, sorry, if we scroll down in the um, locate manager here, we can see that we have selected four 82 kilonewton wheel loads at a spacing that is appropriate for the vehicle that we're looking at. So we have in our loads database a superimposed pressure load and we also have our vehicle with the four wheel loads on it. The last thing we want to do is actually create a number of copies of that vehicle to move it across the slab. So we're um, replicating the movement of a vehicle from one side of the slab to the other and you may want to do it in a few different directions but in our case we're just going to move it from left to right. Uh, you can see actually that we have a number of low cases set up already but what I'm going to do is I will delete these low cases just so that we I can show you how easy it is to set these up so if we imagine that I just have the first low case that I set up with our vehicle at the left hand side of the slab all I'm going to do is select the axle loading and superimpose loading and copy those and I want to copy it in the x direction at one meter spacing nothing in the y direction and I'm going to create six copies of that so basically moving the vehicle from the left to the right six instances at a one meter spacing and if I click OK just get a warning that self weight and pressure loads don't offset because obviously you don't want to dissociate um, pressures from the geometry that they're associated with um, but we have a number of load cases that are now set up across the slab. So if I click OK, what we can do is we'll start on with load case 1 there and we can scroll through and you can see the four points of that loading moving across. So we've got, again, as previously, we've got a geometry, we've got some supports, we have material for our slab and we also now have loading which is moving across that slab. Um, what we can now do is just um, analyze it. The first thing I want to do though is if I go to tools and preferences is that I want to set the viewpoint in bridge analysis mode so that means that if we have a moving load that the view of it doesn't change um, according to that it actually centers on the slab itself and makes sure that you can compare the different um, failure mechanisms easily against each other. So if I click on solve now what we can see again as previously we've got this warning that um, there are solids where we have material properties for self weight but we're not actually considering self weight in the problem we also have a warning saying that occasionally some of the um, wheel loads exist outside the slab so uh, if you had mistakenly applied a point load outside of the slab this gets picked up on here. In, in our case we don't mind because in each of the cases there is always going to be at least one of the wheels within our vehicle that is um, driving collapse on top of the slab. So we don't mind about that, we're just going to click OK and solve and see what happens. And what we can see is that the software then goes through each of the load cases and works out what the critical failure mechanism and the associated adequacy factor is for that particular problem and once it's gone through all the different low cases, which should be in a second, it will pick out the one with the lowest adequacy factor and report that back to you as being the one that is likely critical for this particular problem. So what we can see here is, if I just return that back to zero, that low case 12, which is actually the sixth of the seven low cases here, um, is the one that is being um, shown as being critical, but what we can do is just very quickly go through the different failure mechanisms and if I turn on the display of the loading you can see how that matches up with our vehicle so you can see here we've got a fan type failure mechanism that's associated with this particular wheel and as we move through 
and more wheels come into contact with the slab, you can see how that failure mechanism changes. And we can see that the adequacy factor in this case is about 1.38, 1.4. So that's saying to us that we can multiply up our 82 kilonewton wheel load by 1.4 to um, see what the actual maximum wheel load we can take is. So that's somewhere around the 110 kilonewton mark. So in this case, the slab's okay, but if we wanted to investigate further, what I would suggest is that as the wheel loading is getting closer to the free edge, this adequacy factor is going down. So we may want to look in this area more carefully. So. That's the second of our examples. The last one I'm going to show you now is very quickly um, the example of a beam slab. So if I go back to the presentation, what we can see is a beam and slab bridge deck, so a little like the one that Matthew showed earlier. And this is actually based on an example in uh, Jackson's thesis from Cambridge in 2010, uh, which is in turn based on um, a scale model test that Hazel had done a few years earlier and it's essentially simply supported longitudinal beams which are separated by a thinner deck slab. Um, it's quite lightly reinforced in the slab whereas the deck has, um, sorry, the beams have much more substantial reinforcement. So we can see here that we have a couple of patch loads that's going to be applied to it and we can see the cross section of the slab there and um, what we're looking for is um, a load factor of less than about 62 although we don't have exact details for the material properties for this particular problem so um, we can't compare it directly but we can make a good guess so if I go back to my problem here what we're going to do now actually is import a geometry from file so instead of um, looking at starting a slab and drawing it from scratch what we're actually going to do is open a DXF file so you won't have seen that because it's just on our screen but um, I've selected my DXF file and the import has asked me um, a few things about it so it's saying we're going to use meters by default and this is the dimensions of it so they actually correspond quite well to the ones that we saw on the presentation just now if I click OK then you can see that the DXF essentially takes closed loops and makes them into selectable solids so if you have lines that form closed loops in your DXF file when you read them into slab it will make them into solids for you so that's a very quick way of getting in potentially quite complex slab definitions into it. So what we've done is we've imported our geometry. Again, we want to go through the process of adding boundaries. So I'm going to have simple supports at the top and the bottom. And then we want to add our mechanical properties into it. So the first thing we want to do is define our slab. So we have a new structural definition which is called slab. I'll make that quite light so that we can differentiate it from the beams and in that one our positive MP is 5 and our negative MP is 3 in the first direction and in the second direction it's the same again so um, same in both ways and our thickness if we were going to take it into consideration which we can put in just for the case of this is 0 0.044 and unit weight again of 24. So we've made our slab material now we just need to make our beam material and I'll differentiate that by making it a blue color and as we said this one's going to be a lot more um, rigid so 150 and 120 in the first direction and then 500 and 300 in the second direction and our thickness um, obviously the beams are much deeper so it's not 0 0.204 but the self weight is roughly the same so unit weight of 24 so we've got our geometry we've got our boundary conditions now what we can do is we can add these structural definitions to the right places 
within the model. And you've seen that we can drag and drop. What we can also do is select all of the individual zones at the same time. And if we click on change here, you can see I can very quickly just assign beam to every single one of them in one go. So the last thing we need to do now is to add loading to it. So we're going to add one kilonewton point loads to the centers of these places on the left where the patch loading was applied. So if I click on this, this will actually say, you can see it says add point load to the current load case. Um, if I turn on the grid, I can zoom in and select the point in the middle of there. And I can also select one there. Actually, I don't want it at zero, one. What I want it is at... 0.051 so you can see now two point loads in the middle of those patches there so because we want quite a, an accurate solution what I'm going to do is actually switch the nodal density to very fine so if you remember back to the presentation when Matthew was going um, through the DLO process you saw that we um, flood the design domain with nodes um, obviously the more nodes you put into it the more um, close to the arithmetic optimum solution you're going to get so if I put very fine that's basically 2,000 nodes within the problem whereas uh, medium is about 500 so it's about four times as many nodes um, which would give us a much more accurate solution so if I now click solve again we have this warning about the self weight we don't need to worry about that click OK and what we'll see is that you can see yeah, there's a lot more nodes in the problem here and our failure mechanism is a lot more refined a lot more complex so we can see here that our adequacy factor is 54 so that's less than the 62 um, that was present in the original work from Jackson but then um, what we can also do is look at the animation and see um, how that fails as it stands. So the mechanism is um, in the same form as is identified by Jackson but is a lot more refined. Just finally for this example one of the things that we might want to do as we saw in the last example is we might want to traverse the load across the bridge and um, we can do that I'm not going to do it here because of the time available um, but what I can do is actually if I open this and drag it across you can see here um, this is just the same problem but rotated 90 degrees and we're moving the vehicle load across from left to right in a slight diagonal and what's interesting is that when the four wheels actually lie over the top of the slab we get a slightly different failure mechanism than we do in the other cases where in the other cases we're getting failure in the slab portions with just simple hinges in the beams in the one where we have all four in the middle we're getting these fan type failure mechanisms as well so that's just something that gets picked up um, by the software so we've very quickly gone through three different examples of um, analyzing bridge type problems, using limit state slab, um, moving vehicles across the problem in order to identify the critical position, uh, working out what the factor on the load is in order to cause collapse. What we do now is um, we're actually at the end of the presentation part. I'll just see if we have any questions that have been asked. Um, if you do have one that you want to ask then do feel free to type it in now um, and we'll try and get round to it okay and um, there's none currently but what I'll do is um, I'll go back to one of the questions we got um, a previous time that we've run this webinar which is um, can you model columns in the software and that's something that we haven't really touched on here but is something that is eminently possible so I'll just use this particular example here because it's already made um, modeling columns is a very simple process all you need to do is select an area where your column is if you delete the material from inside it 
and then for the boundaries around the outside select them and set them to either fixed or simple or partially fixed as necessary depending on whereabouts um, and how the slab is fixed to the column if I set this to fixed um, for this particular example and then what we can do is solve again and we can see now that previously we had this failure mechanism that went through just this part of the slab um, but now it's taking into account this lack of um, material there and also the fixity around the edge of the column so we can see now we've got a slightly different failure mechanism to the one that we had before and failure occurs in a different manner and our solution has gone from 54 so we can multiply our load up by a factor of 54 to 68 so introducing that column into it has actually made the structure uh, more resistant to the loading which is what we would expect from um, the application of a column in there. Okay, um, we've had a question, and I'll go through it um, very briefly. What's the difference between the red and the blue lines in the failure diagrams, and what are the lighter lines? So if I just return this animation back to zero, we can see here especially that we have red and blue, and we've also got some that are thicker than others. So um, if I deal with the thickness first, the thickness of the line just um, illustrates how much that yield line is rotating. So all of these lines are the yield lines that have been identified by the optimization and the thickness of them when we display it is just showing you how much that particular part is rotating. So you can get a feeling for the areas of the structure that are um, most critical. So we can see here that there's a lot of lines but they're very thin so the deflections and the rotations there are likely to be less than around this column here where we've got this high amount of rotation. Um, the red and the blue just refers to the hogging and the sagging moment so if I animate it here we can see that um, or maybe we can't, but um, the yield lines are actually either um, opening up or they're closing b back down, and that's just um, illustrating whether or not the that part of the slab is starting to sag or whether it's starting to hog, um, and it's just the red and the blue differentiates between those two things. I'm conscious that that's um, probably about the end yes um, the last thing for us to do is just to look at the conclusions so we've shown that the yield line method provides a powerful means of analyzing the ultimate limit state um, limit state slab addresses the lack of a general computer-based implementation for the yield line method and we have automated it using discontinuity layout optimization which is a linear optimization problem that is easy to solve and you can identify a wide range of different failure mechanism types automatically. So things like fan type mechanisms, which are um, traditionally can be a little difficult to um, identify, especially with FEA methods, then we can do that automatically using DLO. And Limit State Slab software is available for people to download from our website, which is limitstate.com. So the last thing I'd just like to say um, is, yes, thanks for everybody to join us. If you do have any questions that have been prompted by the webinar, then please do get in touch with us via telephone or you can email us at info at limitstate.com and we're always happy to help out there. Um, a recording of this webinar is going to be made available uh, probably later today or tomorrow morning on our YouTube channel and we'll be in touch with you all via email with a link once it's up there for you to watch. Um, please do feel free to share it amongst your colleagues, anybody who may be interested, um, just send them the link. You might also be interested to know yourselves that we have a number of forthcoming webinars that cover all the Limit State product range, um, so please do look out for the event notifications that we send out via email or post on our website and share via social media. Um, so lastly, I'd just like to thank you all again for taking the time to join us today, and we do hope to see you all again soon for one of our future sessions. Goodbye.